And now chapter 25 of the Madhyalila, how all the residents of Varanasi became Vaishnavs. After converting into Vaishnavs all the residents of Varanasi, who were headed by the sannyasis, and after completely educating Swami at Varanasi, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu returned to Jagannath Puri. All glories to Lord Chaitanya, all glories to Lord Nityananda, all glories to Advaita Chandra, and all glories to all the devotees of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed Sri Sanatan Goswami in all the conclusions of devotional service for two consecutive months. For as long as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Varanasi, Parmananda Kirtaniya, who was a friend of Chandra Shekhar's, chanted the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and other songs to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in a very humorous way. When the Mayavadi sannyasis at Varanasi criticized Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Lord's devotees became very depressed. To satisfy them, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu showed his mercy to the sannyasis. In the seventh chapter of Adi Lila, I have already elaborately described Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's deliverance of the sannyasis at Varanasi, but I shall briefly repeat it in this chapter. When the Mayavadi sannyasis were criticizing Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu anywhere and everywhere in Varanasi, the Maharashtrian Brahmin, hearing this blasphemy, began to think about this unhappily. The Maharashtrian Brahmin thought, Whoever closely sees the characteristics of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu immediately realizes his personality and accepts him as the Supreme Lord. If by some means I can assemble all the sannyasis together, they will certainly become his devotees after seeing his personal characteristics. I shall have to reside at Varanasi the rest of my life. If I do not try to carry out this plan, I shall certainly continue to suffer mental depression. Thinking like this, the Maharashtrian Brahmin extended an invitation to all the sannyasis of Varanasi. After doing this, he finally approached Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to extend him an invitation. At this time, Chandra Shekhar and Tapan Mishra both heard blasphemous criticisms against Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and felt very unhappy. They came to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's lotus feet to submit a request. They submitted their request, and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, seeing his devotee's unhappiness, decided to turn the minds of the Mayavadi sannyasis. While Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was seriously considering meeting with the Mayavadi sannyasis, the Maharashtrian Brahman approached him and extended an invitation. The Brahman submitted his invitation with great humility, and he touched the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted his invitation, and the next day, after finishing his noontime activities, he went to the Brahmin's house. I have already described Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's deliverance of the Mayavadi sannyasis in the seventh chapter, when I described the glories of the Panchatattva. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Nityananda Prabhu, Advaita Prabhu, Gadadhar Prabhu, and Sri Vas. Since I have already described this incident very elaborately in the seventh chapter of Adi Lila, I do not wish to increase the size of this book by giving another description. However, I shall try to include in this chapter whatever was not described there. Beginning from the day on which Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu showed his mercy to the Mayavadi sannyasis, there were vivid discussions about this conversation among the inhabitants of Varanasi. 
Crowds of people came to see Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from that day on, and scholars of various scriptures discussed different subject matters with the Lord. When people came to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to discuss the principles of various scriptures, the Lord defeated their false conclusions and established the predominance of devotional service to the Lord. With logic and argument, He very politely changed their minds. As soon as people received instructions from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they began to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Thus everyone laughed, chanted, and danced with the Lord. All the Mayavadi sannyasis offered their obeisances unto Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and then began to discuss his movement, giving up their studies of Vedanta and Mayavad philosophy. One of the disciples of Prakashananda Sarasvati, who was as learned as his guru, began to speak in that assembly, offering all respects to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He said, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan Himself. When He explains the Vedanta Sutra, He does so very nicely. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains the direct meaning of the Upanishads. When all learned scholars hear this, their minds and ears are satisfied. Giving up the direct meaning of the Vedanta Sutra and the Upanishads, Shankaracharya imagines some other interpretation. All the interpretations of Shankaracharya are imaginary. Such imaginary interpretations are verbally accepted by learned scholars, but they do not appeal to the heart. The words of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are firm and convincing, and I accept them as true. In this age of Kali, one cannot be delivered from material clutches simply by formally accepting the renounced order. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's explanation of the verse beginning Hare Nam, Hare Nam is not only pleasing to the ear, but is strong factual evidence. In this age of Kali, one cannot attain liberation without taking to the devotional service of the Lord. In this age, even if one does not chant the holy name of Krishna perfectly, he still attains liberation very easily. As it is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, my dear Lord, devotional service unto you is the only auspicious path. If one gives it up simply for speculative knowledge, or the understanding that these living beings are spirit soul and the material world is false, he undergoes a great deal of trouble. He only gains troublesome and inauspicious activities. His actions are like beating a husk that is already devoid of rice. One's labor becomes fruitless. O oh, lotus-eyed one, those who think they are liberated in this life, but who are devoid of devotional service to you, are of impure intelligence. Although they accept severe austerities and penances, and rise to the spiritual position to impersonal Brahmin realization, they fall down again because they neglect to worship your lotus feet. The word Brahmin means the greatest. This means that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is full in six opulences. However, if we take the one-sided impersonalist view, His fullness is diminished. Vedic literatures, the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra, and the Puranas all describe the activities of the spiritual potency of the Lord. If one cannot accept the personal activities of the Lord, He jokes foolishly and gives an impersonal description. The Mayavadis do not recognize the personal form of the Lord as spiritual and full of bliss. This is a great sin. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's statements are actually factual. Lord Brahma says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, O Supreme One, the transcendental form I am now seeing is full of transcendental bliss. It is not contaminated by the external energy. It is full of effulgence. My Lord, there is no better understanding of you than this. You are the Supreme Soul and the Creator of this material world, but you are not connected with this material world. You are completely different from created form and variety. I sincerely take shelter of that form of yours, which I am now seeing. This form is the original source of all living beings and their senses. 
Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the cause of all causes. He is past, present, and future, and He is the movable and immovable. He is the greatest and the smallest, and He is visible and directly experienced. He is celebrated in Vedic literature. Everything is Krishna, and without Him there is no existence. He is the root of all understanding, and He is that which is understood by all words. O most auspicious one, for our benefit you are worshipped by us. You manifest your transcendental form, which you show to us in our meditation. We offer our respectful obeisances unto you, the Supreme Person, and we worship you, whom impersonalists do not accept due to their poor fund of knowledge. Thus they are liable to descend into a hellish condition. And in the Bhagavad Gita it is said, Fools disrespect me because I appear like a human being. They do not know my supreme position as the cause of all causes, the creator of the material energy. Those who are envious of my form, who are cruel and mischievous and lowest among men, are perpetually cast by me into hellish existence in various demoniac species of life. Not accepting the transformation of energy, Sri Pad Shankaracharya has tried to establish the theory of illusion under the plea that Vyasdev has made a mistake. Sri Pad Shankaracharya has given his interpretation an imaginary meaning. It does not actually appeal to the mind of any sane man. He has done this to convince the atheists and bring them under his control. The atheists, headed by the Mayavani philosophers, do not care for liberation or Krishna's mercy. They simply continue to put forward false arguments and counter-theories to atheistic philosophy, not considering or engaging in spiritual matters. The conclusion is that the import of the Vedanta Sutra is covered by the imaginary explanation of Sankaracharya. Whatever Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said is perfectly true. Whatever meaning Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives is perfect. Any other interpretation is only a distortion. After saying this, the disciple of Prakashananda Sarasvati began to chant the holy name of Krishna. Hearing this, Prakashananda Sarasvati made the following statement. Shankaracharya was very eager to establish the philosophy of monism. Therefore, he explained Vedanta Sutra, or Vedanta philosophy, in a different way to support monistic philosophy. If one accepts the personality of Godhead, the philosophy that maintains that God and the living entity are one cannot be established. Therefore, Shankaracharya argued against and refuted all kinds of revealed scriptures. Anyone who wants to establish his own opinion or philosophy certainly cannot explain any scripture according to the principle of direct interpretation. The Mimamsak philosophers conclude that if there is a God, he is subjected to our fruitive activities. Similarly, the Sankhya philosophers who analyze the cosmic manifestation say that the cause of the cosmos is material nature. The followers of Niyaya, the philosophy of logic, maintain that the atom is the cause of the cosmic manifestation. And the Mayavati philosophers maintain that the impersonal Brahman effulgence is the cause of the cosmic manifestation. The Patanjala philosophers say that when one is self-realized, he understands the Lord. Similarly, according to the Vedas and Vedic principles, the original cause is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. After studying the six philosophical theses, Vyasadev completely summarized them all in the codes of Vedanta philosophy. According to Vedanta philosophy, the absolute truth is a person. When the word nirguna, without qualities, is used, it is to be understood that the Lord has attributes that are totally spiritual. Of the philosophers mentioned, none really cares for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the cause of all causes. 
they are always busy refuting the philosophical theories of others and establishing their own. By studying the six philosophical theories, one cannot reach the absolute truth. It is therefore our duty to follow the path of the Mahajans, the authorities. Whatever they say should be accepted as the supreme truth. Dry arguments are inconclusive. A great personality whose opinion does not differ from others is not considered a great sage. Simply by studying the Vedas, which are variegated, one cannot come to the right path by which religious principles are understood. The solid truth of religious principles is hidden in the heart of an unadulterated, self-realized person. Consequently, as the Shastras confirm, one should accept whatever progressive path the Mahajans advocate. The words of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are a shower of nectar. Whatever he concludes to be the ultimate truth is indeed the summum bonum of all spiritual knowledge. After hearing these statements, the Maharashtrian Brahmin very jubilantly went to inform Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When the Maharashtrian Brahmin went to see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Lord was going to the temple of Bindu Madhava after bathing in the waters of the Panchanada. While the Lord was on his way, the Maharashtrian Brahmin informed him about the incident that took place in the camp of Prakashananda Sarasvati. Hearing this, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu smiled happily. Upon reaching the temple of Bindu Madhava, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, seeing the beauty of Lord Bindu Madhava, became overwhelmed in ecstatic love. He then began to dance in the courtyard of the temple. There were four people accompanying Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and these were Chandra Shekhar, Parmananda Puri, Tapan Mishra and Sanatan Goswami. They were all chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra in the following way. Hare Nama Krishna Yadavaya Namaha Gopal Govindaram Sri Madhusudan. In all directions, hundreds and thousands of people began to chant Hari Hari. Thus there arose a tumultuous and auspicious sound filling the entire universe. When Prakashananda Sarasvati, who was staying nearby, heard this tumultuous chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, he and his disciples immediately came to see the Lord. When Prakashananda Sarasvati saw the Lord, he and his disciples also joined the chanting with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Prakashananda Sarasvati was charmed by the Lord's dancing and ecstatic love and by the transcendental beauty of his body. Ecstatic spiritual transformations began to take place in the Lord's body. His body trembled and his voice faltered. He perspired, turned pale, and wept a constant flow of tears which wet all the people standing there. The eruptions on the Lord's body appeared like kadamba flowers. All the people were astonished to see the Lord's jubilation and humility and to hear him talk in ecstasy. Indeed, all the residents of Benares, or Kashi, saw the bodily transformations and were astonished. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu regained his external consciousness, he saw that many Mayabadi sannyasis and other people were gathered there. He therefore suspended his dancing for the time being. After stopping the kirtan, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was a great example of humility, offered prayers unto the feet of Prakashananda Sarasvati. At this, Prakashananda Sarasvati immediately came forward and clasped the Lord's lotus feet. When Prakashananda Sarasvati caught hold of the Lord's lotus feet, the Lord said, My dear sir, you are the spiritual master of the whole world. 
Therefore you are most worshipable. As far as I am concerned, I am not even on the level of the disciple of your disciple. You are a great spiritually advanced personality, and therefore you cannot worship a person like me. I am far inferior. If you do so, my spiritual power will be diminished, for you are as good as the impersonal Brahman. My dear sir, for you everyone is on the level of impersonal Brahman, but for the enlightenment of people in general, you should not behave in that way. Prakashananda Sarasvati replied, Formerly I have committed many offenses against you by blaspheming you, but now the effects of my offenses are counteracted by my touching your lotus feet. As it is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, if a person considered liberated in this life commits offenses against the reservoir of inconceivable potencies, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he will again fall down and desire the material atmosphere for material enjoyment. Being touched by the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, that serpent was immediately freed from the reactions of his sinful life. Thus the serpent gave up his body and assumed the body of a beautiful Vidyadhara demigod. When Prakashananda Sarasvati supported himself by quoting the verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu immediately protested by uttering the holy name of Lord Vishnu. The Lord then presented himself as a most fallen living entity, and he said, If someone accepts a fallen conditioned soul as Vishnu or Bhagavan or an incarnation, he commits a great offense. To say nothing of ordinary living entities, even Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva cannot be considered on the level of Vishnu or Narayan. If one considers them as such, he is immediately considered an offender and atheist. A person who considers demigods like Brahma and Shiva to be on an equal level with Narayan is to be considered an offender or a Pashandi. Prakashananda replied, You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna himself. Nonetheless, you are considering yourself his eternal servant. My dear Lord, you are the Supreme Lord, and although you consider yourself the Lord's servant, you are nonetheless worshipable. You are much greater than I am. Therefore, all my spiritual achievements have been lost because I have blasphemed you. As it is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, O great sage, out of many millions of materially liberated people who are free from ignorance, and out of many millions of siddhas who have nearly attained perfection, there is hardly one pure devotee of Narayan. Only such a devotee is actually completely satisfied and peaceful. When a person mistreats great souls, his lifespan, opulence, reputation, religion, possessions, and good fortune are all destroyed. Unless human society accepts the dust of the lotus feet of great Mahatmas, devotees who have nothing to do with material possessions, Mankind cannot turn its attention to the lotus feet of Krishna. Those lotus feet vanquish all unwanted miserable conditions of material life. Henceforward, I shall certainly develop devotional service unto your lotus feet. For this reason, I have come to you and have fallen down at your lotus feet. After saying this, Prakashananda Sarasvati sat down with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and began to question the Lord as follows. Prakashananda Sarasvati said, We can understand the faults you have pointed out in the Mayavad philosophy. All the explanations given by Sankaracharya are imaginary. My dear Lord, whatever direct meaning you have given when explaining the Brahma Sutra is certainly very wonderful to all of us. You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and therefore you have inconceivable energies. I wish to hear from you briefly about the Brahma Sutra. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied, I am an ordinary living being, and therefore my knowledge is very insignificant. However, the meaning of the Brahma Sutra is very grave, because its author, Vyasadeva, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. The purpose of the Vedanta Sutra is very difficult for an ordinary person to understand. 
but Vyasadeva, out of his causeless mercy, has personally explained the meaning. If the Vedanta Sutra is explained by Vyasadeva himself, who has written it, its original meaning can be understood by the people in general. The meaning of the sound vibration, Omkar, is present in the Gayatri Mantra. The same is elaborately explained in the four shlokas of Srimad Bhagavatam, known as Chatu Shloki. Whatever was spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead to Lord Brahma in the four verses of Srimad Bhagavatam was also explained to Narad by Lord Brahma. Whatever Lord Brahma told Narad Muni was again explained by Narad Muni to Vyasdev. Vyasdev later considered these instructions in his mind. Srila Vyasdev considered that whatever he had received from Narad Muni as an explanation of Omkar, he would elaborately explain in his book, Srimad Bhagavatam, as a commentary on Brahma Sutra. Vyasdev collected whatever Vedic conclusions were in the four Vedas and 108 Upanishads and placed them in the codes of the Vedanta Sutra. In Vedanta Sutra, the purpose of all Vedic knowledge is explained, and in Srimad Bhagavatam, the same purpose has been explained in 18,000 verses. That which is explained in the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam and in the Upanishads serve the same purpose. As mentioned in the Bhagavatam, everything animate or inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should therefore accept only those things for himself that are set aside as his quota, and one should not accept other things knowing well to whom they belong. The essence of Srimad Bhagavatam, our relationship with the Supreme Lord, our activities in that connection and the goal of life, is manifest in the four verses of Srimad Bhagavatam known as the Chatu Shloki. Everything is explained in those verses. Lord Krishna says, I am the center of all relationships. Knowledge of me and the practical application of that knowledge is actual knowledge. Approaching me for devotional service is called Abhideya. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Lord says to Lord Brahma, By rendering devotional service, one gradually rises to the platform of love of Godhead. That is the chief goal of life. On the platform of love of Godhead, one is eternally engaged in the service of the Lord. Please hear attentively what I shall speak to you, for transcendental knowledge about me is not only scientific, but full of mysteries. O Brahma, I shall explain all these truths to you. You are a living being, and without my explanation, you will not be able to understand your relationship with me, or devotional activity, and life's ultimate goal. I shall explain to you my actual form and situation, my attributes, activities, and six opulences. Lord Krishna assured Lord Brahma, By my mercy, all these things will be awakened in you. Saying this, the Lord began to explain the three truths, or tattvas, to Lord Brahma. By my causeless mercy, be enlightened in truth about my personality, manifestations, qualities, and pastimes. Before the creation of the cosmic manifestation, the Lord said, I existed, and the total material energy, material nature, and the living entities all existed in me. After creating the cosmic manifestation, I entered into it. Whatever you see in the cosmic manifestation is but an expansion of my energy. When the whole universe dissolves, I remain full in myself and everything that is manifested is again preserved in me. Prior to the cosmic manifestation, only I exist, and no phenomena exist, either gross, subtle, or primordial. After creation, only I exist in everything, and after annihilation, only I remain eternally. In the verse beginning, Aham Eva, the word Aham is expressed three times. In the beginning, there are the words Aham Eva. In the second line, there are the words Paschad Aham. At the end are the words So Smyaham. This Aham indicates the Supreme Person. 
by the repetition of Aham, the transcendental personality who is complete with six opulences, is confirmed. Impersonalists do not accept the personal feature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Personality of Godhead is stressed in this verse in order to impress upon them the necessity of accepting Him. Therefore the word Aham is mentioned three times. To stress something important, one repeats it three times. Lord Krishna further says, Actual spiritual knowledge and its practical application are considered in all these sound vibrations. Although the external energy comes from me, I am different from it. Sometimes a reflection of the sun is experienced in place of the sun, but its illumination is never possible independent of the sun. When one is transcendentally situated, he can perceive me. This perception is the basis of one's relationship with the Supreme Lord. Now let me further explain this subject matter. What appears to be truth without me is certainly my illusory energy, for nothing can exist without me. It is like a reflection of a real light in the shadows, for in the light there are neither shadows nor reflections. Now please hear from me about the process of devotional service, which is applicable in any country, for any person, at all times, and in all circumstances. As far as religious principles are concerned, there is a consideration of the person, the country, the time, and the circumstance. In devotional service, however, there are no such considerations. Devotional service is transcendental to all considerations. It is therefore the duty of every man, in every country, in every circumstance, and at all times, to approach the bona fide spiritual master, question him about devotional service, and listen to him explain the process. A person interested in transcendental knowledge must therefore always directly and indirectly inquire about it to know about the all-pervading truth. The Lord says, Supreme affection for me is called love of Godhead, and that is the ultimate goal of life. Let me explain by practical example the natural characteristics of such love. The five material elements are existing inside and outside of every living entity. Similarly, I, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, am manifest within the heart of the devotee as well as outside his body. As the material elements enter the bodies of all living beings and yet remain outside them all, I exist within all material creations and yet am not within them. A highly elevated devotee can bind me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, in his heart by love. Wherever he looks, he sees me and nothing else. Hari, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who destroys everything inauspicious for his devotees, does not leave the hearts of his devotees even if they remember him and chant about him inattentively. This is because the rope of love always binds the Lord within the devotees' hearts. Such devotees should be accepted as most elevated. A person advanced in devotional service sees within everything the soul of souls, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Consequently, he always sees the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the cause of all causes and understands that all things are situated in him. All the gopis assembled to chant the transcendental qualities of Krishna very loudly, and they began to wander from one forest to another, like mad women. They began to inquire about the Lord who is situated in all living entities internally and externally. Indeed, they even asked all the plants and vegetables about him, the Supreme Person. 
one's relationship with the Lord, activities and devotional service, and the attainment of the highest goal of life, love of Godhead, are the subject matters of Srimad Bhagavatam. The Absolute Truth is known by the self-realized souls as a unified identity known by different names, impersonal Brahman, localized Paramatma, and Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Before the cosmic manifestation was created, the creative propensity was merged in his person. At that time, all potencies and manifestations were preserved in the personality of the Supreme Lord. The Lord is the cause of all causes, and He is the all-pervading, self-sufficient person. Before the creation, He existed with His spiritual potencies in the spiritual world, wherein various Vaikuntha planets are manifest. All these incarnations of Godhead are either plenary portions or parts of the plenary portions of the Purusha avatars. But Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself. In every age He protects the world through His different features when the world is disturbed by the enemies of Indra. This is one's eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now please hear about the execution of devotional service. This principle pervades practically all the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam. Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavatam, Being very dear to the devotees and sadhus, I am attained through unflinching faith and devotional service. This bhakti yoga system, which gradually increases attachment for me, purifies even a human being born among dog-eaters. That is to say, everyone can be elevated to the spiritual platform by the process of bhakti yoga. The Lord further says, My dear Uddhava, neither through Ashtanga Yoga or the mystic yoga system to control the senses, nor through impersonalism or an analytical study of the Absolute Truth, nor through the study of the Vedas, nor through practice of austerities, nor through charity, nor through acceptance of sannyas, can one satisfy me as much as one can by developing unalloyed devotional service unto me. When the living entity is attracted by the material energy, which is separate from Krishna, he is overpowered by fear. Because he is separated from the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the material energy, his conception of life is reversed. In other words, instead of being the eternal servant of Krishna, he becomes Krishna's competitor. This is called Vipariyo, Smriti. To nullify this mistake, one who is actually learned and advanced worships the Supreme Personality of Godhead as his spiritual master, worshipful deity, and source of life. He thus worships the Lord by the process of unalloyed devotional service. Now hear for me what actual love of Godhead is. It is the prime object of life and is symptomatized by bodily trembling tears in the eyes, chanting, and dancing. Pure devotees develop a spiritual body and symptoms of ecstatic love simply by remembering and reminding others of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, who takes away everything inauspicious from the devotee. This position is attained by rendering devotional service according to the regulative principles and then rising to the platform of spontaneous love. When a person is actually advanced and takes pleasure in chanting the holy name of the Lord, who is very dear to him, he is agitated and loudly chants the holy name. He also laughs cries, becomes agitated, and chants like a madman, not caring for outsiders. Srimad Bhagavatam gives the actual meaning of the Vedanta Sutra. The author of the Vedanta Sutra is Vyasdev, 
and he himself has explained those codes in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. The meaning of the Vedanta Sutra is present in Srimad Bhagavatam. The full purport of the Mahabharat is also there. The commentary of the Brahma Gayatri is also there and fully expanded with all Vedic knowledge. Srimad Bhagavatam is the Supreme Purana and it was compiled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead in His incarnation as Vyasadeva. There are twelve cantos, three hundred and thirty-five chapters and eighteen thousand verses. The essence of all Vedic literature and all histories has been collected in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is accepted as the essence of all Vedic literature and Vedanta philosophy. Whoever tastes the transcendental mellow of Srimad Bhagavatam is never attracted to any other literature. In the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam there is an explanation of the Brahma Gayatri Mantra. The words, the absolute truth, indicates the relationship, and we meditate on him indicates the execution of devotional service and the ultimate goal of life. As it is said in the opening of the Srimad Bhagavatam, I offer my obeisances unto Lord Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva, who is the supreme all-pervading personality of Godhead. I meditate upon him the transcendent reality, who is the primeval cause of all causes, from whom all manifested universes arise, in whom they dwell, and by whom they are destroyed. I meditate upon that eternally effulgent Lord, who is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations, and yet is beyond them. It is He only who first imparted Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahma, the first created being. Through Him this world, like a mirage, appears real even to great sages and demigods. Because of Him the material universes, created by the three modes of nature, appear to be factual, although they are unreal. I meditate therefore upon Him, the Absolute Truth, who is eternally existent in His transcendental abode, and who is forever free of illusion. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated, this Bhagavat Purana propounds the highest truth which is understandable by those devotees who are pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam, compiled by the great sage Sri Vyasadeva, is sufficient in itself for God-realization. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of the Bhagavatam, he becomes attached to the Supreme Lord. Srimad Bhagavatam gives direct information of the mellow derived from service to Krishna. Therefore, Srimad Bhagavatam is above all other Vedic literatures. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the essence of all Vedic literatures and it is considered the ripened fruit of the wish-fulfilling tree of Vedic knowledge. It has been sweetened by emanating from the mouth of Shukdev Goswami. You who are thoughtful and who relish mellows should always try to taste this ripened fruit. O oh, thoughtful devotees, as long as you are not absorbed in transcendental bliss, you should continue tasting this Srimad Bhagavatam. And when you are fully absorbed in bliss, you should go on tasting its mellows forever. We never tire of hearing the transcendental pastimes of the Personality of Godhead, who is glorified by hymns and prayers. Those who enjoy association with Him relish hearing His pastimes at every moment. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu advised Prakashananda Sarasvati, Study Srimad Bhagavatam very scrutinizingly. Then you will understand the actual meaning of Brahma Sutra. Always discuss Srimad Bhagavatam and constantly chant the holy name of Lord Krishna. In this way you will be able to attain liberation very easily, and you will be elevated to the enjoyment of love of Godhead. 
One who is thus transcendentally situated at once realizes the Supreme Brahman and becomes fully joyful. He never laments nor desires to have anything. He is equally disposed to every living entity. In that state, he attains pure devotional service unto me. Even a liberated soul merged in the impersonal Brahman effulgence is attracted to the pastimes of Krishna. He thus installs a deity and renders the Lord service. Shukdev Goswami addressed Parikshit Maharaj, My dear King, although I was fully situated in the transcendental position, I was nonetheless attracted to the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Therefore I studied Srimad Bhagavatam from my father. And further in the Srimad Bhagavatam it is stated, When the breeze carrying the aroma of tulsi leaves and saffron from the lotus feet of the lotus-eyed personality of Godhead entered through the nostrils into the hearts of those sages, the Kumaras, they experienced a change in both body and mind, even though they were attached to impersonal Brahman understanding. Those who are self-satisfied and unattracted by external material desires are also attracted to the loving service of Sri Krishna, whose qualities are transcendental and whose activities are wonderful. Hari, the personality of Godhead, is called Krishna because he has such transcendentally attractive features. At this time, the Brahmin from the province of Maharashtra mentioned Lord Chaitanya's explanation of the Atmaram verse. The Maharashtrian Brahmin stated that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had already explained that verse in 61 ways. Everyone was astonished to hear this. When all the people gathered there expressed the desire to hear again the 61 different meanings of the Atmaram Shloka, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again explained them. When everyone heard Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's explanation of the Atmaram Shloka, everyone was astonished and struck with wonder. They concluded that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was none other than Lord Krishna himself. After giving those explanations again, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu arose and took his leave. All the people there offered their obeisances unto him and chanted the Maha Mantra. All the inhabitants of Kashi began chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra in ecstatic love. Sometimes they laughed, sometimes they cried, sometimes they chanted, and sometimes they danced. After this, all the Mayavadi sannyasis and learned scholars at Varanasi began discussing Srimad Bhagavatam. In this way, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu delivered them. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu then returned to his residence with his personal associates. Thus he turned the whole city of Varnasi into another Navadvip. Among his own associates, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu laughingly said, I came here to sell my emotional ecstatic love. Although I came to Varnasi to sell my goods, there were no customers, and it appeared necessary for me to carry them back to my own country. All of you were feeling unhappy that no one was purchasing my goods and that I would have to carry them away. Therefore, by your will only, I have distributed them without charging. All the Lord's devotees then said, You have incarnated to deliver fallen souls. You have delivered them in the east and in the south, and now you are delivering them in the west. Only Varnasi was left because the people there were against your missionary activities. Now you have delivered them, and we are all very happy. After the news of these events was broadcast, everyone from the surrounding neighborhoods began to pour in to see Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hundreds and thousands of people came to see Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. There was no counting the number. Because the Lord's residence was very small, not everyone could see him. 
When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to take his bath in the Ganges and to see the temple of Vishveshvara, people would line up on both sides to see the Lord. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu passed by the people, he would raise his arms and say, Please chant Krishna! Please chant Hari! All the people received him by chanting Hare Krishna, and they offered their respects to him by this chanting. In this way, for five days, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu delivered the people of Varanasi. Finally, on the next day, he became very eager to leave. After rising very early on the sixth day, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu started to leave, and five devotees began to follow him. These five devotees were Tapan Mishra, Raghunath, the Maharashtrian Brahmin, Chandra Shekhar, and Parmananda Kirtaniya. These five wanted to accompany Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Jagannath Puri, but the Lord attentively bade them farewell. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, If you want to see me, you may come later, but for the time being I shall go alone through the Jarakanda forest. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu advised Sanatan Goswami to proceed toward Vrindavan, and he informed him that his two brothers had already gone there. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told Sanatan Goswami, All my devotees who go to Vrindavan are generally very poor. They each have nothing with them but a torn quilt and a small water pot. Therefore, Sanatan, you should give them shelter and maintain them. After saying this, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu embraced them all and began to proceed on his way, and they all fainted and fell down. After some time, all the devotees got up and returned to their homes very much grief-stricken. Sanatan Goswami proceeded toward Vrindavan alone. When Rupa Goswami reached Mathura, he met Subhuti Rai on the banks of the Yamuna at a place called Dhruva Ghat. Formerly, Subhuti Rai had been a big landholder in Godadesh or Bengal. Sayyad Hussein Khan was then a servant of Subhuti Rai. Subhuti Rai put Hussein Khan in charge of digging a big lake, but once, finding fault with him, he struck him with a whip. Later, Hussein Khan somehow or other was appointed Nawab by the central Mohammedan government. As a matter of obligation, he increased the opulences of Subhuti Rai. Later, when the wife of Nawab Sayyad Hussein Khan saw the whip marks on his body, she requested him to kill Subhuti Rai. Hussein Khan replied, Subhuti Rai has maintained me very carefully. He was just like a father to me. Now you are asking me to kill him. This is not a very good proposal. As a last alternative, the wife suggested that the Nawab take away Subhuti Rai's caste and turn him into a Mohammedan. But Hussein Khan replied that if he did this, Subhuti Rai would not live. This became a perplexing problem for him because his wife kept requesting him to kill Subhuti Rai. Finally, the Nawab sprinkled a little water on Subhuti Rai's head from a pitcher that had been used by a Mohammedan. Taking the Nawab's sprinkled water upon him as an opportunity, Subhuti Rai left his family and business affairs and went to Varnasi. When Subhuti Rai consulted the learned Brahmins at Varnasi, asking them how his conversion to Mohammedanism could be counteracted, they advised him to drink hot ghee and give up his life. When Subhuti Rai consulted some other Brahmins, they told him that he had not committed a grievous fault and that consequently he should not drink hot ghee and give up his life. As a result, Subhuti Rai was doubtful about what to do. In his state of perplexity, Subhuti Rai met Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when the Lord was at Varanasi. Subhuti Rai explained his position and asked Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu what he should do. The Lord advised him, 
Go to Vrindavan and chant the Hare Krishna mantra constantly. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu further advised Subhuti Rai, Begin chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, and when your chanting is almost pure, all your sinful reactions will go away. After you chant perfectly, you will get shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna. When you are situated at the lotus feet of Krishna, no sinful reaction can touch you. This is the best solution to all sinful activity. Thus receiving the order from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to go to Vrindavan, Subhuti Rai left Varnasi and went through Prayag, Ayodhya and Naimasharanya toward Vrindavan. Subhuti Rai stayed for some time at Naimasharanya. During that time, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to Prayag after visiting Vrindavan. After reaching Mathura, Subhuti Rai received information of the Lord's itinerary. He became very unhappy because he was not able to contact the Lord. Subhuti Rai would collect dry wood in the forest and take it to the city of Mathura to sell. For each load he would receive five or six pice. Earning his livelihood by selling dry wood, Subhuti Rai would live on only one pice's worth of fried chickpeas and he would deposit whatever other pices he had with some merchant. Subhuti Rai used to spend his savings to supply yogurt to Bengali Vaishnavs who came to Mathura. He also gave them cooked rice and oil massages. When he saw a poverty-stricken Vaishnav, he would use his money to feed him. When Rupa Goswami arrived at Mathura, Subhuti Rai, out of love and affection for him, wanted to serve him in so many ways. He personally took Rupa Goswami to see all the twelve forests of Vrindavan. Rupa Goswami remained in Mathura and Vrindavan for one month in the association of Subhuti Rai. After that he left Vrindavan to search for his elder brother Sanatan Goswami. When Rupa Goswami heard that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had gone to Prayag on the road along the banks of the Ganges, both Rupa and his brother Anupam went that way to meet the Lord. After reaching Prayag, Sanatan Goswami, following the order of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, went to Vrindavan along the public road. When Sanatan Goswami met Subhuti Rai at Mathura, Subhuti Rai explained everything about his younger brothers, Rupa Goswami and Anupam. Since Sanatan Goswami went along the public road to Vrindavan, and Rupa Goswami and Anupam went on the road along the Ganges banks, it was not possible for them to meet. Subhuti Rai and Sanatan Goswami knew one another before accepting the renounced order. Therefore, Subhuti Rai showed much affection to Sanatan Goswami, but Sanatan Goswami hesitated to accept his sentiments and affections. Being very advanced in the renounced order, Sanatan Goswami used to wander from forest to forest, never taking shelter of any habitation built of stone. He used to live under trees or beneath bushes both day and night. Srila Sanatan Goswami collected some books about archaeological excavations in Mathura, and wandering in the forest he sought to renovate all those holy places. Sanatan Goswami remained in Vrindavan, and Rupa Goswami and Anupam returned to Varnasi. When Rupa Goswami arrived at Varnasi, he met the Maharashtrian Brahmin, Chandra Shekhar and Tapan Mishra. While Rupa Goswami was staying at Varnasi, he resided at the house of Chandra Shekhar and took prasad at the house of Tapan Mishra. In this way, he heard of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instructions to Sanatan Goswami in Varnasi. While staying at Varnasi, Rupa Goswami heard of all Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's activities. When he heard of his deliverance of the Mayavadi sannyasis, he became very happy. 
When Rupa Goswami saw that all the people of Varanasi respected Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he became very happy. He even heard stories from the general populace. After staying in Varanasi for about ten days, Rupa Goswami returned to Bengal. In this way, I have described the activities of Rupa and Sanatan. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu returned to Jagannath Puri, he passed through the solitary forest and he received great pleasure in doing so. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu happily returned to Jagannath Puri in the company of his servant Balabhadra Bhattacharya. As previously, the Lord performed many pleasing pastimes with the forest animals. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu arrived at a place known as Ataranala near Jagannath Puri, he sent Balabhadra Bhattacharya to call for his devotees. Hearing news of the Lord's arrival from Balabhadra Bhattacharya, hordes of devotees became so happy that they seemed to be getting their lives back. It was as though their consciousness had returned to their bodies. Their senses also became agitated. Being overwhelmed with great pleasure, all the devotees hastily went to see the Lord. They met Him on the banks of Narendra Sarovara, the celebrated lake. When Parmananda Puri and Brahmananda Bhadati met Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Lord offered them His respectful obeisances due to their being God-brothers of His spiritual master. They both then embraced Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in love and affection. Devotees like Svarup Damodar, Gadadhar Pandit, Jagadananda, Kashishvar, Govinda and Vakrishvar all came to meet the Lord. Kashi Mishra, Pradyumna Mishra, Damodar Pandit, Haridas Thakur and Shankara Pandit also came there to meet the Lord. All the other devotees also came and fell down at the Lord's lotus feet. In return, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu embraced them all with great ecstatic love. Thus they all merged in the ocean of transcendental bliss. Then the Lord and all His devotees proceeded toward the temple of Jagannath to see the deity. As soon as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw Lord Jagannath in the temple, He was immediately overwhelmed with love and affection. He chanted and danced with his devotees for a long time. The priests immediately brought them flower garlands and prasad. The temple's watchman, who was named Tulsi, also came and offered his obeisances to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When the news spread that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had arrived at Jagannath Puri, devotees like Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, Ramananda Rai and Vaninath Rai all came to meet him. The Lord and all his devotees then went to the residence of Kashi Mishra. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya and Pandit Goshani also invited the Lord to dine at their homes. Accepting their invitation, the Lord asked them to bring all the prasad there so that he could eat it with his devotees. Upon receiving Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's order, both Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya and Pandit Goshani brought sufficient prasad from the temple of Jagannath. The Lord then dined with everyone at his own place. Thus I have described how Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu returned to Jagannath Puri from Vrindavan. Whoever hears Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes with faith and love very soon attains shelter at the Lord's lotus feet. I have thus given a summary of the Madhya Leela, which is a special description of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's travels to and from Jagannath Puri. Indeed, the Lord traveled to and fro continuously for six years. After taking sannyas at the age of twenty-four, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu lived another twenty-four years. 
For six of these years, he traveled extensively throughout India, sometimes going to Jagannath Puri and sometimes leaving. After traveling for six years, the Lord fixed his residence at Jagannath Puri and stayed there for 18 remaining years of his life. During these 18 years, he mainly chanted Hare Krishna with his devotees. I shall now chronologically reassess the chapters of Madhyalila so that one can relish the transcendental features of these topics. In the first chapter, I have given a synopsis of the last pastimes, or Antialila. Within this chapter is a vivid description of some of the pastimes of the Lord that took place toward the end of His life. In the second chapter, I have described Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's talking like a crazy man. Within this chapter, it is indicated how Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifested his different emotional moods. In the third chapter, I have described the Lord's acceptance of the renounced order and how he enjoyed his pastimes in the house of Advaita Charya. In the fourth chapter, I have described Madhavendra Puri's installation of the Gopal deity as well as Gopinath stealing a pot of condensed milk at Ramuna. In the fifth chapter, I have narrated the story of Sakshi Gopal. Lord Nityananda Prabhu narrated this while Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu listened. In the sixth chapter, I have told how Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya was delivered. And in the seventh chapter, I have described the Lord's tour of different holy places and His deliverance of Vasudev. In the eighth chapter, I have recorded the Lord's elaborate discussion with Ramananda Roy. The Lord personally listened as Ramananda gave the conclusive essence of all Vedic literatures. In the ninth chapter, I have described the Lord's tour of South India and the different places of pilgrimage. In the tenth chapter, I have described the meeting of all the devotees of the Lord. In the eleventh chapter, I have described the great chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra that surrounded the Lord. In the twelfth chapter, I have given a narration of the cleansing and washing of the Gundicha temple. In the thirteenth chapter, I have described Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's dancing before the chariot of Jagannath. In the fourteenth chapter, there is an account of the Heda Panchami function. Also in the fourteenth chapter, the emotional ecstasy of the gopis was described by Svarup Damodar and tasted by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In the fifteenth chapter, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu highly praised the qualities of his devotees and accepted lunch at the house of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. At that time, he delivered a moga. In the sixteenth chapter, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu departed for Vrindavan and journeyed through Bengal. He later returned to Jagannath Puri from Kanai Natasala. In the seventeenth chapter, I have described the Lord's journey through the great forest of Jarakanda and His arrival at Mathura. In the eighteenth chapter, there is a description of His tour of the forest of Vrindavan. In the nineteenth chapter, the Lord returned to Prayag from Mathura and empowered Sri Rupa Goswami to spread devotional service. In the twentieth chapter, the Lord's meeting with Sanatan is described. The Lord described the personal features of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in depth. In the twenty-first chapter, there is a description of Krishna's beauty and opulence. And in the twenty-second chapter, there is a description of the twofold discharge of devotional service. 
In the 23rd chapter, there is a description of the mellows of transcendental loving service. And in the 24th chapter, the Lord analyzes the Atmaram verse. In the 25th chapter, there is a description of how the residents of Varnasi were converted to Vaishnavism. The Lord also returned to Nilachal, or Jagannath Puri, from Varnasi. I have thus summarized these pastimes in the 25th chapter. Hearing this, one can understand the whole purport of this scripture. I have now summarized the entire subject matter of the Madhya Lila. These pastimes cannot be described elaborately even in millions of books. To deliver the fallen souls, the Lord traveled from country to country. He personally tasted the transcendental pleasure of devotional service, and he simultaneously spread the cult of devotion everywhere. Krishna consciousness means understanding the truth of Krishna, the truth of devotional service, the truth of love of Godhead, the truth of emotional ecstasy, the truth of transcendental mellow, and the truth of the pastimes of the Lord. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has personally preached the transcendental truths and mellows of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam and the Supreme Personality of Godhead are identical, for Srimad Bhagavatam is the sound incarnation of Sri Krishna. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu broadcast the purpose of Srimad Bhagavatam. He sometimes spoke for the benefit of his devotees and sometimes empowered one of his devotees to speak while he listened. All sane men within these three worlds certainly accept the conclusion that no one is more merciful and magnanimous than Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and that no one is as kind to his devotees. All devotees should hear about Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes with faith and love. By the grace of the Lord, one can thus attain shelter at his lotus feet. By understanding the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, one can understand the truth about Krishna. By understanding Krishna, one can understand the limit of all knowledge described in various revealed scriptures. The pastimes of Lord Krishna are the essence of all nectar. They flow in hundreds of rivulets and in all directions. The pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are an eternal reservoir, and one is advised to let his mind swim like a swan on this transcendental lake. With humility, I submit myself to the lotus feet of all you devotees, taking the dust from your feet as my bodily ornaments. Now, my dear devotees, please hear one more thing from me. Devotional service to Krishna is exactly like a pleasing, jubilant forest of lotus flowers, wherein there is ample honey. I request everyone to taste this honey. If all the mental speculators bring the bees of their minds into this forest of lotus flowers and jubilantly enjoy ecstatic love of Krishna day and night, their mental speculation will be completely, transcendentally satisfied. The devotees who have a relationship with Krishna are like the swans and chakravaka birds that play in the forest of lotus flowers. The buds of those lotus flowers are the pastimes of Krishna, and they are edibles for the swan-like devotees. Lord Sri Krishna is always engaged in his transcendental pastimes. Therefore, the devotees, following in the footsteps of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, can always eat those lotus buds, for they are the pastimes of the Lord. All the devotees of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu should go to that lake and, remaining always under the shelter of the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu,
become swans and chakrabaka birds in those celestial waters. They should go on rendering service to Lord Sri Krishna and enjoy life perpetually. In this way, all miseries will be diminished. The devotees will attain great happiness and there will be jubilant love of God. The devotees who have taken shelter of the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu take the responsibility for distributing nectarine devotional service all over the world. They are like clouds pouring water on the ground that nourishes the fruit of love of Godhead in this world. The devotees eat that fruit to their heart's content, and whatever remnants they leave are eaten by the general populace. Thus they live happily. The pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are full of nectar, and the pastimes of Lord Krishna are like camphor. When one mixes these, they taste very sweet. By the mercy of the pure devotees, whoever tastes them can understand the depths of that sweetness. Men become strong and stout by eating sufficient grains, but the devotee who simply eats ordinary grains but does not taste the transcendental pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Krishna gradually becomes weak and falls down from the transcendental position. However, if one drinks but a drop of the nectar of Krishna's pastimes, his body and mind begin to bloom and he begins to laugh, sing and dance. The readers should relish this wonderful nectar because nothing compares to it. Keeping their faith firmly fixed within their minds, they should be careful not to fall into the pit of false arguments or the whirlpools of unfortunate situations. If one falls into such positions, he is finished. In conclusion, I submit to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Nityananda Prabhu, Advaita Prabhu, and all the other devotees and readers that I accept your lotus feet as the helmet on my head. In this way, all my purposes will be served. Taking the feet of Srila Rupa Goswami, Sri Sanatan Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami, Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, and Jiva Goswami on my head, I always desire their mercy. Thus I, Krishna Das, humbly try to describe the nectar of the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which are mixed with the pastimes of Lord Krishna. For the satisfaction of Sri Madhapal and Govindadev, I pray that this book, Chaitanya Charitamrita, may be offered to Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The Chaitanya Charitamrita pastimes of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu constitute a very secret literature. It is the life and soul of all devotees. Those who are not fit to relish this literature, who are envious like hogs and pigs, will certainly not adore it. However, this will not harm my attempt. These pastimes of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will certainly please all saintly people who have clear hearts. They will certainly enjoy it. We wish that this will enhance their enjoyment more and more. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithyananda this ends chapter 25 of the Madhya Leela. The residents of Varnasi become Vaishnavs. And this ends the Madhya Leela. <laughs>